Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Harry Brelsford from SMB Nation. Thank you, thank you, thank you for attending our weekly webinar. Um, I, I say that every week, and, and, and here's why. Because we're on the West Coast. It's 10 a.m. It's uh, just after lunch on the East Coast at 1 p.m. This time of year with the uh, daylight time, it's uh, the early uh, evening, late afternoon over in Europe. So we're pulling you away from perhaps some uh, evening activities. Um, so I know your time is valuable. And every week lately, I've been able to say with the markets at new highs and a lot of economic activity going on, um, we're seeing people, time is now your most precious commodity, that you're busy. So the fact that we've been able to enjoy uh, uh, some of your time today for an hour, I just want to thank you up front. With that said, um, this is a really cool webinar because uh, a lot of times our attendees will ask for some meat on those bones. And we're going to deliver in spades today as we talk about storage. It also brings back memories a few listeners may recall back in 2005 and 2006. Uh, we did a book on uh, sand storage for S&Bs. That's, that's, that's not exactly what we're talking about today, of course, but it's it's in the same universe um, and, and big league storage. And uh, so if you, you, you kind of want to close your eyes and harken back to the book that Carl Palachuk and I did on sand storage, you, you kind of get the overreaching picture. Now, with that said, uh, we have a well-known industry veteran and an SMB 150 award winner, Chris Sturmbank. And I'm Chris, if I get that wrong again, my friend, I get it wrong every time, so correct me on the... Uh, <laughs> Correct me on the last name, but Chris, it's just been a pleasure to follow you in your career, and and you're literally in good company over at Gridstore. So congratulations for joining them and helping them out. Um, why don't we jump right into it, sir? And uh, thank you so much for coming today. Hey, thanks, Harry, and uh, no problem with the name. It's one of those uh, classic Eastern European names that no one can spell or pronounce. But uh, I'll give you all an easy mnemonic. Uh, it rhymes with disturbance. So I love it. Urban, oh, you're disruptive. Yeah, <laughs> uh, very disruptive. And uh, according to my father, he wanted to actually name me Dis, but my mom wouldn't let him, so they went with Chris, as it turns out. So uh, I've also got with me here Matt Olive, who is our uh, sales engineer. Good morning. All right. So what we're going to dig into today is uh, around storage. And really what we want to focus on is some of the unique requirements and challenges around storage in a virtualized environment and specifically backing up uh, virtualized environments of VMware or Hyper-V stacks. Uh, they put a lot more stress on storage targets than a lot of traditional you know, file share or, or NAS or SAN solutions. And uh, Gridstore has taken a, a pretty unorthodox and very different approach to storage for this environment. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me just go ahead and proceed here. So we're going to break this into three sections. We're going to discuss first some of the context that has kind of framed the business problem. Uh, then I'm going to hand it over to Matt, and he is going to walk you through uh, an overview of the solution to give you a sense of what we've done to address some of the shortcomings of the more uh, typical storage solutions that you bump into in this space. Uh, we'll take some questions at that point around the product and how it works, and after that we'll give you just a very brief uh, touch on our pricing model and the Grid Store Partner Program if you're interested in uh, joining our channel. So I'd like to open up with a couple of surveys that we've pulled from. The first one is a Gardner survey from a couple years ago, and they actually pulled a few thousand IT uh, sysadmins, CIOs from SMB all the way up into the enterprise, and they basically pulled on what are the top concerns as an IT, um, head of IT for a company as you look forward in the future. And number one, data growth. Just the rate of data growth, the amount of data growth, all of the challenges that spill out in terms of providing proper storage, uh, network capacity, um, you know, latency, all those different issues get affected by this. And you can see that there's a number of other things that came up, but number one, top of the list, data growth, top of mind for all of these IT administrators. Nearly half of them put this as their number one concern. And one of the things that's really interesting is that virtualization is one of the big drivers for the rate of data growth that we're seeing. 
Um, I think we all know that pretty much no one ever seems to ever delete anything. So, uh, and now that you've got uh, stacks of VMs running, uh, and then you throw in some backup with your incrementals and retentions, you're looking at some pretty dramatic uh, speed in terms of how quickly your data is growing. And this is another one that came back out of Instat last year. And what they found was that the typical company is doubling their data in slightly less than two years. Uh, some companies even faster than that, but this just compounds the issue when you're trying to make decisions about your storage solutions. Hey, um, Chris, a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, back in 05, as Carl and I were researching the SAN book, um, and, and, and again, it's, uh, it's, let's just say it's in the same college. It's not necessarily the same major. Um, the research we were doing in 05 was pointing towards this type of rapid data growth. But the context back then uh, was kind of surrounding a thing that we now take for granted, that someday you'll be able to download movies. And um, do you have a sense of the type of data growth? And, and is it multimedia, or is it just, you know, people have gone wackadoo with relational databases creating big data? I, I, I'm just curious if that played out with the downloadable movies. Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, especially in SMB. You, you do find people doing, you know, personal use, uh, MP3s, you know, their music libraries, uh, movies, all kinds of videos and those sorts of things. Uh, that definitely does come into play, but I think that what we find is that there's a couple of industries where they really, really have bumped into this rampant data growth, and it's driven more by, you know, compliance with things like HIPAA, or SOCs where they're absolutely required to retain, you know, patient medical record data for seven years or yeah. or financial data for ten years and essentially unstructured data. So really it comes down to structured or unstructured data. Uh, my experience coming out of the uh, public cloud and infrastructure hosting space and managed solutions is essentially like Chris is saying with PCI SOCs, HIPAA, uh, FERPA, on ramp, pick your pick your compliance state. Um, it's all about unstructured data because, again, we can't throw anything away. We've got to keep emails. We've got to keep documents. We have to keep uh, notes, conversations, et cetera. If it was all relational uh, and structured data, oh, that, that, would, that would make the administrator's life much simpler. But unfortunately, that's not what we're getting. Um, so really, uh, in my opinion, from what I understand in talking with the, um, you know, the EMCs and the NetApp guys of the world and those architects, it's all about unstructured data and the fact that Social networking has also went heavily into that. Um, so again, we're not throwing anything away. Yeah, and actually, well, uh, and one last. Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Harry. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, just another wise crack. Forgive me, Chris. I told you I was going to annoy you along the way, but uh, <laughs> um, but 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 that's actually a really important point. Is that a lot of our audience came up through the uh, the Microsoft product stack, of course, and back office and small business server were SQL was included as part of the bundle, and there's even a few of us on the call that got SQL certified um, <laughs> back in the 90s and, and forward to support Great Plains and some other things. And so the gentleman, the, sir, the, the, the point you just raised is really important. That, that That's absolutely true. If it were all relational, that's that's one thing, but the unstructured, I get it. I get it that it's a lot bigger. Chris, I'll, I'll go back on mute and behave, sir. I promise. Oh, okay, I'm just chip in any time. We love your comments. And uh, the last last thing I'm going to throw at that particular theme that we were just discussing is in uh, engineering and construction, uh, they, and, and your graphic artists, you tend to have these big graphics files. And there's another great example of stuff where they'll keep, you know, multiple iterations and never delete anything. And it just, it adds up to massive data growth. And it's not something that they necessarily need a high speed ability to access. They just need the ability to pull it off disk at some point down the road. So you see massive data growth and archiving type environment for those particular verticals as well. So uh, back to backup. So uh, some of you may know me from my three years at Axiom. I come out of the backup and disaster recovery space over the last three years. And yeah, we worked with uh, literally uh, hundreds of MSPs and thousands of deployments. And there were some really big takeaways uh, personally that I got from that experience. And the first one really comes down to the big sizing question. Okay, we're going to put a brand new backup solution in place. How much capacity are we going to need to support this thing? Uh, everybody 
typically has the attitude that they want to spend the absolute bare minimum that they need to be able to accommodate uh, a quality backup solution. And it's really a challenge because it's going to affect dramatically the price that you're going to pay for that capacity. And there's a lot of different things that you need to keep in mind when you go through that. So you start with, what's my native data that I'm going to protect? Um, and then I've got to take a look at what, what kind of daily churn am I looking at? Because you're going to generate you know, incrementals to that backup every day. And uh, if you've got a huge exchange or SQL database that's got a lot of transactions, you may find that you've got pretty fat amount of churn there, and that's going to generate big incrementals. And then the other big driver is growth. And we've probably just flogged the whole growth horse to death over the last 10 minutes. But, but that's another thing you've got to keep in mind. Some companies don't have to worry about that much data growth. And the, the average company that we saw in SMB across more than 5,000 companies was around 1% per month growth. But in those specific verticals that we just talked about, dramatically higher growth rates. And that's something that you've got to take in mind as well. And then the last thing that we touched on as well was those retention policies. Um, you know, seven years, 10 years, whatever the retention policy has been defined by your industry or by, you know, whatever your corporate guidelines are. Those are the four big drivers. You do the math on that, and at the end of that, you've got to determine what time window are you trying to accommodate as well. Three years used to be the most typical um, request that folks kind of went after when they went through the sizing until they saw the price. And then after a big gulp, they would go, oh, maybe, maybe 18 months or two years would be fine because we're not ready to drop you know, that much money up front. And so that led to some different conversations. But, but this is a dialogue that we had over and over and over with these companies. And it's the balance between buying enough capacity uh, and keeping the absolute cost up front as low as possible. And, and this is probably the single biggest tension point as every company looks at rolling out a brand new backup solution. And so what's interesting about that is it leads directly to two results, neither one of which are very positive. Um, and I try to kind of contrast them with the, uh, the angel and the devil there. Uh, the first one is the easier of the two solutions, but it's the one that everybody backs away from when they see the price tag, which is let's just go ahead and buy so much capacity that we don't have to worry about ever outgrowing it. Because, you know, let's, let's go get that 50 terabyte compellent unit for $60,000. Uh, oh wait, this is my backup solution. I don't know that the CFO is going to, you know, sign off on that one. So let's go the other route and let's buy a last. And then what typically happens, and this to me was rather humorous because we did these two and three year projections. Uh, people bid off more than they wanted to spend and then ultimately always outgrew it before they thought they would. I put 99% because uh, there was probably that one in a blue moon that actually did their storage projection and didn't fill it up, but my experience was that it always happened, and it always happened earlier than they thought they would. Um, just underestimating growth and churn and all those other things. So uh, again, this is one of the key areas as people look at this, and it leads directly to a number of challenges uh, with the current technologies that they've had to use for uh, their storage targets in a D2D &D backup environment. So the the specific uh, example that we want to drill into, again, is that virtualized environment. And as, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, you don't typically convert your entire environment in one go. You'll typically take a look at everything that you're doing. You'll stand up your very first VMware or Hyper-V stack. And then you'll bring over one small workload, probably not a mission critical one, uh, in case it blows up. Uh, and so you wind up with that first one. You get it in production. And it's a pretty small environment. So if you're looking for a, a quick and dirty way to get some disk target, go get that DAS unit. You know, Buffalo, uh, Netgear ReadyNAS, the Drobo. Uh, you know, inexpensive, plug it in, game on. It all works just fine. And, and you can see that that little green arrow there uh, shows that you're easily going to make your daily backups within the window. And a lot of companies, you know, try to get this done between, say, midnight and 6 a.m. and whatnot. And they've got some restriction in terms of when they do their backups so that they don't impact production. Um, and then, so this is all goodness, and you're like, great, and then start to bring some more workload over, and then things get a little bit more challenging, and oh, hey, we filled up that DAS. What do we do next? Well, you go get another one, uh, and there's always some risk here because they are cheap and easy. You've got a single point of failure. 
in that these DAS devices frequently don't have any sort of RAID or, or redundancy or recovery if something goes wrong. You add the second one, you've now doubled your risk. And, and what it really turns out as you start to add these things is it's just a Band-Aid to the problem. This is not going to be a scalable solution as you bring more and more uh, applications and workload online. And, and as you can see, it's still working with the green bar. You're still getting them done within the backup window. But uh, at some point, you're going to cross that threshold with the third, your fourth. Or uh, the world record that we've uncovered is one of our uh, partners on uh, uh, Beltway Bandit out of Baltimore uh, had eight Drobo devices and watched his backup window go from under six hours to over 36 hours, in addition to all the challenges of juggling uh, the data load across eight different Drobo devices. And he found himself in a mode where he was purchasing another one about every five to six weeks. Uh, didn't look like a great way to go in the long term. And, and this is frequently a lot of companies' experience when they get started with the DAS solution. So uh, now some companies, they, they start with a more mature approach and, and they skip the DAS thing altogether and they, they go large and they go buy that, you know, that EMC. They go buy that, that compellent. Uh, with you know tens of terabytes of capacity, um, big expense up front. That red bar shows you spending big dough, but you've now eliminated that concern about uh, failing to meet your backup window because you've provided enough capacity. And typically, it's a higher performing storage target. Uh, but once again, this comes back to that CFO. Uh, I don't know too many IT administrators that have that uh, fabled unlimited budget. We'd all love to have it. Uh, sky's the limit, nothing's too good for me, I want to go get that Cadillac storage solution for my backup. Uh, conversation doesn't usually fly all that well with the CFO, although I do know a few folks that have managed to weasel that one through. And then ultimately, you know, you're looking at some giant money to make that happen, and ultimately you're going to bump into the other problem we talked about before, which is that you're almost guaranteed to be wrong when you guess on the capacity, even when you buy these bigger boxes you inevitably fill them up, and you fill them up way before you thought you would. Uh, I've got an MSP partner in the Boston area uh, that spent a lot of money to put a 30 terabyte SAN solution in. Uh, they're the target for their Veeam backups of all the customers they were hosting in their data center, and they filled it up in the first 90 days. And they had some serious uh, explaining to do when they went back to their CFO uh, about why that was a great approach to things when they had to go buy another one. And then, which led to the logical question is, are we going to be buying another one of these every three months? Which led to some tense moments at that company, I can, I can assure you. And, and this is also a problem that's leading. Go ahead, Harry. Go ahead, oh, Harry. No. Okay, well, sorry to interject. Uh, first a joke and then, and then some housekeeping. Uh, the, 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 the joke is the unlimited budget part of your slide. Um, Chris, that was called 2005. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Amen, brother. I, I remember those days. Um, the, the other thing is housekeeping, folks. If you could use the chat feature to ask your questions, we have Heather over in the control room who will be uh, uh, active with the, uh, um, she'll, she'll, she'll be actively uh, getting the questions over to me and we'll ask that when appropriate. Um, please continue, gentlemen. All right, so we're back, and uh, we've really framed, I think, the business problem that a lot of folks are experiencing. Uh, if you've not hit this wall, you're probably either just doing research or planning to virtualize, or you're early on in your adoption cycle. Uh, so we've now covered the go small, cheap, and easy, and the drawbacks of that solution, and then we followed that up with the unlimited budget of 2005 uh, with, the, with the Cadillac solution. So. What's in between? What's the Goldilocks? You know, if only somewhere in the world there was a solution that would allow you to, you know, start with just what you need today and then incrementally add storage as you grow, not only capacity but also performance-wise uh, in terms of uh, the amount of data traffic so that you can continue to hit that backup window. The drawback we covered with the DAS is even as you added additional DAS devices for capacity, the performance impact was pretty dramatic and ultimately you were failing to meet your backup window. Uh, so you need to, in addition to scaling capacity in a perfect solution, scale your, your I.O. and your uh, processing power. 
And then finally, just add additional capacity as you grow, but have it all still be seamlessly one storage pool for your backup environment. And this is really, in a perfect world, what you would like to have. And so this is what we have set out at GridStore to achieve for you. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Matt Olive, who's going to walk through these solutions. Cool. Thank you, Chris. So, um, and also part of the planning capacity, just to touch on that real quick, there's any time you run into problems like that, obviously the industry responds. I'm starting to see more storage reporting and auditing tools. I believe the acronym that's being thrown around nowadays is SRM, um, storage resource management tools, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're lucky enough to afford those and use them, that will help you with the planning capacity, but it doesn't always guarantee it, um, especially in virtual environments where we have this ability to spin up dozens of machines that we tend to forget about them over time, QA, engineering, et cetera. They always want things on. Um, so again, something to think about. All right, so back to our agenda. So uh, what we're looking at here is basically the traditional uh, storage as we all know it and love it today. This is how it's been for years and years. Um, essentially what we're looking at here is in monolithic storage we have a number of clients. We have the limited I.O., limited controller processing, and limited capacity. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's simple. When you look at these chassis boxes, whether it's a DAS, NAS, or a SAN, um, they do have a limited amount of actual physical controllers on these things. You can only stick so much hardware into a chassis. Um, same thing with capacity. You only get X amount of shelves. I believe Dell's MD3220 units give you something like 24 bays to play with. And depending on whether you go three and a half or two and a half and form factor and all these other things, again, limited capacity, start adding shelves. Um, and, and, uh, and the limited I.O., again, you're really kind of stuck with what you get, what that box is capable of as it comes from the manufacturer. Now, we get creative in operations. Um, we start doing backplaning. We, we start leveraging the fact that all these servers that we work with nowadays typically are going to come with two NIC cards in them and then your maintenance NIC for your for your LILOs or your DRAC, whatever it is that you're going to do with those. But you find yourself using one of those N, uh, GBIC 1 or 2 for your storage backplaning, perhaps monitoring something else, your backup networks, and then you put all your primary production VIPs and traffic up on the primary. So anyway, back to this problem. So as we move forward, what we decided to do is let's take the appliance and let's remove some of the software and, and, and take that stack and spread it out. And what did we do? So what we did is we took the storage capacity, and instead of presenting it in file systems, uh, we present storage V pools, which essentially we can take our storage and we can carve it up in any way, shape, or form that you choose to, which of course is why we're all looking at the software-defined storage industry in the first place, because it's allowing us to do uh, what we want to do with the storage and not what EMC or NetApp or, or HP or Hitachi has dictated to us that we need to do. We have a much different workload nowadays, things like thin provisioning and other aspects that come with virtualization that we have to contend and deal with to optimize the environments. So the next thing that we've done is we looked at how do you scale capacity without over-provisioning, right? If I only need two terabytes, I really don't want to buy an entire shelf just to stick into my unit. Uh, and again, maybe only occupying one or two slots just to achieve that and then having a bunch of empty space. Not a good cost savings, sucking up more power than we need to in the data center, et cetera. So what we've done is we have made it so each one of our storage nodes is a building block. And we allow you to have an unlimited amount of storage nodes uh, as you rack and stack these things on the back end to achieve the, uh, the density that you're trying to achieve on capacity. The next thing we've done is we looked at the limited controller processing, right? So if every time we added more storage capacity, it would be cool on these units if they had additional expansion slots to shove in more, uh, you know, controller processing power. Typically we don't. So again, how do we deal with this? Well, we decided take that stuff off of the appliance in the first place and stick it out on the client. And then we can virtualize that controller, put it on the client. What we've done is we have basically taken all of that post-processing off of the array and put it onto the client where it probably should be in the first place. So we're buffering the I.O., we're, we're eliminating any duplicate requests, we're optimizing that information before it actually goes out of the client device, i.e. the V controller, into the storage nodes. And then we'll look at this last piece. Go ahead, Chris. 
Oh, that was me? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the I.O. and the fact that uh, we are due parallel processing. Yeah, and we are going to cover that in more depth here. But again, this is kind of the approach, the old way of doing things, that 25, 30 year architecture that we all grew up and, and, and learned on. And now with the new, uh, the way uh, VMware and Hyper-V and Zen have virtualized uh, compute, and the way that uh, the Naseras and the M-Brains, et cetera, of the world have done software-defined networking, this was absolutely right for disruption. These guys have been allowed to roam free in these environments for way too long and dictate our policies. So software-defined storage vendors, us and a plethora of others, have gone out and, and tried to rethink this whole paradigm. So let's go a little bit deeper about how we got there. All right, so really this is basically the elements of grid architecture. It's really two simple components. You've got the V controller that's going to live on the client and then the actual storage node, which is essentially a 1U um, rackable form factor. Um, it, we're very familiar with this stuff. There's nothing too weird on the back of these things. It's got a simple uh, gigabit Ethernet port that plugs right into your LANs. As long as you put these things on the same VLAN, they will see and communicate with each other. We do have some... Uh, um, um, ARP type capabilities between our devices if you, if you want to get a little technical there. Um, but for the most part our grids are well aware of who they are and then when you launch the managers you can simply work at those. These things are incredibly easy to deploy. Um, this is, doesn't take an advanced degree in anything. You're not using sand switch architecture. You're not having to worry about multi-tiering anything to get these guys connected. Very straightforward. Any data center technician can basically set this stuff up without an advanced degree. It's pretty straightforward. If you know how to use a screw gun, I think you'll be okay. All right, so again, some more elements of this grid architecture. What we see here is uh, uh, the V controller, which is the virtualized storage controller running on the client. This is a Windows uh, device driver. Uh, for all intents and purposes, when Windows looks at the grid, it will be utilizing a UNC path naming convention, for example, G colon, or if you were to do a start run, you could go backslash, backslash, storage node name, and then the V pool that you're mapping to. The grid storage nodes, these are very cost effective. They're modular. Um, they are blocks. You just stack them as you need them. And the best thing here is basically think cloud pricing modeling and, and pay-as-you-go price modeling. We've done that um, down to the storage level. So pay for what you need, when you need, we'll get it out to you very quickly. We do control the manufacturing, we do control the distribution. We can RMA. Um, smart guys, you're obviously going to uh, have a few boxes spare sitting around the office, so that way you can, depending on your RTO, RPO, and the SLAs you have with your customers. And as far as like the grid network compatibility, nothing weird going on here as long as you're running standard Ethernet TCP IP protocols internally, uh, you'll be quality and good to go. This massively parallel I.O. statement we're going to get a little bit more into this, but essentially what we're doing, and we'll talk again more about erasure coding and other things in a moment, but we are taking data and we're doing, essentially, we're not replicating. We are taking the data, we chunk it up, we erasure and code it, and then we push it out to as many storage nodes as are available on the back end. So it's a multi-thread push out, massive parallel I.O. down to the storage nodes. So it's highly efficient. We're not worrying about a lot about replication and other things because multiple copies of the data are going out in a mirror with the parity bits built into it. I'll touch more on this in a minute, but basically if you want some homework, it's time to go study up on RAID 6 again and erasure coding and the Reed solomon uh, algorithms. These are basically all underlying secret sauce elements of our architecture, but very important ones. Oh boy! So, you're starting to trauma. You're, you're traumatizing me, but 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 that's okay. I think, <laughs> you know, I've always heard an event, and, and and seriously, an event should be disturbing. You should be disturbed at an event. That's a good event. So now we have disruptive and we have disturbed. But please continue. <laughs> Absolutely. You know what? Um, and and I'll, let me just touch a little bit more about this because I don't want to geek out too much, but I also want to give. Um, technical audience members on this call. Uh, if you're going to go out and read up on some of the articles and, and definitions, you know, don't believe everything I say. Go to Wikipedia and read the articles that we didn't write, specifically the ones about RAID 6 architecture. Read up on erasure codes. And also read up on grid storage architecture. We didn't in invent this concept. This stuff has been out since 04. 
And some really smart guys at Cambridge University took some old school algorithms, the Reed Solomon ones that were developed for inner space communication and reliability on the packets coming back from Voyager, for goodness sake. And what they did is they said, look, there's got to be something better than RAID. Uh, there's got to be something more fault tolerant. You know, bit rot was starting to show up on the scene and other issues. So how do we resolve that? So grid storage architecture came out, and it's essentially everybody feels that really knows this stuff. This is the successor to NAS, and that's the biggest point here. It's the successor to NAS, new way of doing things. Yep, and then we're going to talk about it in the context of backup again. Yep. So when we're talking about backups, especially in the virtual world, we all know that virtual workloads are a little choppy and weird anyways. Um, a lot of random I.O., and when it does show up, it shows up pretty hard and heavy, and then it chills out. Backups tend to be a little more uh, reliable as far as um, um, how the data is streaming in. We realize this. However, when you introduce that into the virtual uh, environments, it actually gets a little strange. So there is some random I.O. There are some data throughput concerns, et cetera. So how do you deal with that? Well, obviously, things like deduplication, compression, and all these other type of things, LAN optimization. So does grid store do that? No. We work as a storage archiving target. We have left that piece up to the backup and restore uh, experts and vendors, the, the beams of the world, the Commvaults, the Symantex, those guys. They've already done it. Why pay for it twice, right? So if I have a virtual environment and I'm using NetApps and I'm using some backup solution, I probably paid two, maybe three times for some of the things that are going to be only used by one vendor in the first place, and you're disabling those other components. So we're very focused on what we do, fault tolerance, uh, high availability. Leave all the finer, uh, sexier things for backups and uh, dealing with random I.O. and the throughput and things of that nature back onto the software vendors doing those solutions. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the high-level benefits, right, the things that the business guys want to know about, easy, resilient savings. Um, you know, this stuff is really easy to install. There's not a huge learning curve here. I don't need to come out to your location for a week straight just to train you on how to use the software that comes with my solution. Just connect it in, power it on, and you're done. It's pretty straightforward, as long as you understand basic network concepts, and most of us do on this call. Manage, like I said, nothing here to new to learn. It integrates with your Active Directory so you can complement group policy and other things of that nature. Uh, it's an MMC snap-in for Windows administrators. So basically, if you know how to use Windows Explorer type tools, um, you're good to go. Everything's fine. And as far as expanding, you know, unlike a lot of vendors where it starts out pretty simple, it's a pretty clean, eloquent solution until you get to a certain scaling point. And then basically, you get to find a new vendor. And this is known as the forklift upgrade. And it's called forklift upgrade because that's what it takes to pick up some of this gear and actually install it in your data center. Um, and that's where that term comes from. We all know that. Some of the other things that we're very good against, uh, you know, we've been talking about all these different, um, you know, basically what we've done is we've taken the whole concept of RAID 6, right? But we've removed it from the storage subsystem and we've extended it across the entire stack from the storage device up to the client. And, and that allows us to really uh, protect against the multiple points of failure. So if we do lose a controller, hey, your data's still down on the storage grid. If we lose a node on the storage grid, because, you know, hardware does fail, at least we have other grids that have erasure-coded erasure copies of the same uh, data spread across multiple volumes. So that way, if we do lose it, we can pull it back. Silent bit rot is not an issue because if one set of the data does have a corruption bit on it, we can pull the safe copy from one of the other storage nodes. Um, and obviously, replacing and managing these things is very, very easy to do. Now, why are we better than RAID? Well, the problem with RAID and other systems like that, again, you're limited to just protecting the disk subsystem. And if we've ever had to rebuild a RAID container of any given size, uh, it can take a bloody long time. Uh, we don't have that issue simply because we're doing massive parallel uh, 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 mirror writes with the parity built in. So if we do lose one of those nodes and we do plug it back in, during the restore rebuild of our appliance, we don't actually have to rebuild the entire device to be used again. We simply join back in parallel with whatever's going on in the grid and we will backfill ourselves while still providing the highest IOPS available uh, from our solution. So it's a very fast rebuild, should not affect performance on existing environments. And um, depending on the, uh, the manner in which you deploy us, 
um, you can actually withstand multiple storage node failures depending on how many redundant nodes you elect to go with. And that question is answered by what is your RTO, RPO, what are your SLAs to your customer, i.e., how fast can I get uh, you know, Johnny data center guy down into that facility to replace a unit? All right. Thanks, Matt. Anytime. So the, the third piece, uh, major benefit of this solution, as we discussed, is the savings. And uh, we've made a number of outrageous claims about how we're significantly less expensive. We wanted to give you one specific example, uh, and we've decided to pick on Dell here. And so if you look at the 16 terabyte uh, model of the Equalogic, uh, you get about 12 to 13 usable terabytes out of that. And the, the list cost for that on the, on the, in the world is $19,000. The equivalent amount of capacity uh, raw capacity from grid store is a little under 12,000 and you actually get more usable capacity so you've got lower costs there but the big whammy moment comes when it's time to add some additional capacity and if it's in the scenario with the Dell you go buy another one and now you're looking at another $19,000 for that next incremental piece of data uh, in our case you just buy one more storage node for 1500 bucks and you've got two more terabytes so this is just an example. I'm going to go to another slide that's got a lot going on on it, but it's based on these specific numbers. Uh, red representing the cost that you are uh, outlaying for your Dell. And so you can see that first bar there is uh, $18,000. And the green bar represents the six terabytes that you need to get started with a grid store. Uh, as you add capacity over time versus having to buy it all up front, you can see the incremental little green bars there. And then you get to the end at 16 terabytes, you can see that the total cost is still significantly less than the Dell. And then you find again the, the giant additional cost when it's time to expand. You're now looking at 38,000 from Dell and you're now just adding $1,500 from the grid store approach. So it's a somewhat busy slide, but I think it, it paints a pretty good picture about how you can get started with just what you need at significantly less cost and then add capacity on the fly over time uh, and it also eliminates some of the hazards of the big guess that we discussed earlier where you've done a two to three year projection uh, you didn't quite get it spot on and you're running out of capacity it's not a major problem for you anymore you're not forced into that forklift upgrade type environment so buy what you need to start add capacity is needed and then the total cost of ownership at every point in the timeline is still less if you go with the grid store architecture. So Harry, uh, did you want to maybe read off some of the questions that have come in about the product stuff? We've got maybe five minutes for that before we wrap up the uh, yeah, slide deck. Yeah. yeah, hold on. Let me get to that screen. I was just uh, undocking the chat feature, <laughs> so I kind of have it. Uh, well, I, I won't bore you with UI and my my challenges. Um, got a few questions. So 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 here we go. Um, number one, are the packages subdividable between MSP clients, or is each node really meant for one client? So you you should think of GridStore as a a NAS a NAS. So it's shared, right? Unlike DAS, which limits the amount of physical connections you can have to it. Um, and DAZs really don't allow long-term, architecturally speaking, for deploying, you know, like clustering or HADRS or storage vMotion just doesn't happen on that. So um, and that's why you work with NAS and SAN. So we are a NAS. We are a scale-out NAS architecture. Um, today, our density dictates that we are awesome at backups. We really meet that market well, and, and that's where we're primarily focused until we come up with a a denser form factor. Does that answer that, Harry? Well, so that, that said, we do have MSPs that are using this in their hosting environments in their data center to support, like I mentioned the one in Boston, more than 30 customers on the, the solution. And uh, each each volume is defined on the fly uh, in terms of the, the, the thin provisioning that we talked about earlier. So yeah. it, it, the architecture really lends itself well to that shared resource environment. Thank you. Uh, next question. Can you run databases from the grid? Well, <clears throat> depends on how your database is configured. And I've actually been reading a lot of articles about this, and I'm sure everybody on the phone has to. File versus block. What's better? When is it more appropriate? One versus the other, et cetera. There's a lot of school of thought on that. Today, we're a file-only solution. So 
today, you have to run a file only system with grid store. We will be supporting block uh, soon. Uh, we, we understand how important that is, especially for the SQL clusters of the world and things of that nature. I mean, clearly requires block level. But again, uh, today is file. Uh, we will support block. And we'll do both really well. Um, it's just today it's file only. That's right, Matt. Uh, native block support for databases like SQL and Exchange, as well as for uh, use in primary storage for VMware and Hyper-V should be released in Q3 of this year uh, in phases. The first pieces will be in production in July, and all of them should be fully supported by the end of September. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. Question, a little, little bit different angle, but um, individuals asking, what major shows or events uh, forthcoming in the industry might they be able to meet with you individually or, or see you and, and, and the individual last life? For, for example, Chris, Chris, will you be at WPC either as an individual or a, a booth? Where, where, where can people learn more in the next several months? Um, sure. Sure, that's a great question. So uh, we've been participating in the ASCII roadshows. Uh, we're coming up on our third one in a couple of, oh, that's next week, actually, in Boston. Uh, yep. We already did Dana Point in uh, Tampa, Boston, I think, followed by uh, Chicago in May, and, and there's four more cities beyond that. Uh, I personally will be up at uh, your show uh, in May up in the well, Seattle you're an area. Award winner. <laughs> well, well, thank you for that. I love it. So I, I can't miss out on that. And then uh, we're definitely planning to be at WPC in Houston in July, because I can't imagine a better place to be than Houston in July, honestly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I feel like outdoor sauna, that is. But uh, we're also going to be at VMworld, which makes sense, given uh, the VMware presence as well. And we're planning to attend IT Nation, which is, as you know, one of the biggest MSP shows of the year uh, for the ConnectWise community in, uh, in Florida. And then the last piece is we are hitting a lot of the, the VMware user groups, uh, the VMUGs and the VTUGs of the world, which are scattered around the country as well. Yeah. Hey, as you were talking, it made me think, and, and if the answer is no, that's that's fine, but are you thinking you'll be at the CompTIA show, I think that's in Orlando in late July, and, and again, I just made that question up, but I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, it's, it's probable that one or more of us will be there, but I don't think we'll be there as an actual vendor with a booth, but uh, we will be available to meet with folks if they want to uh, connect with us while we're there. Okay, okay, right. great. Um, okay. Next, how about one so, more question, and then, or yeah, would you like to move on, and we can queue them up at the end? Yeah. Why don't we Why don't we move on to the last session? I want to make sure people at least get a feel for the actual pricing and the quality of our partner program, and then we'll take any and all questions until we run out of time. How does that sound? Perfect. All right. Let's do it. So uh, the first thing is, you know, why Why would you consider partnering with us uh, aside from our phenomenal Wizzy technology? Uh, the first thing is we're a 100% channel company. Uh, we don't do any direct business. We run 100% of our revenue through our channel of managed service providers and IT resellers that service SMB. Uh, it's a very good margin opportunity. The product is not commoditized. It's not like you're going to be competing with 15 more guys in your city for that next EMC deal, which, uh, as you all know, tends to limit your margins to some pretty thin uh, profit. Uh, we also provide pretty robust marketing support. Uh, we send leads to our partners, which are uh, I found rather popular. And finally, we've got a very simple pricing model. And what I'd like to do is go through each of these in uh, some detail. But let's start with the pricing. Uh, I mentioned it's a simple pricing model because there's basically only two things you need to worry about. Uh, there is the hardware nodes and annual support and maintenance. The nodes are available today in two and four terabyte capacities. Uh, the 8 terabyte denser configuration should be available in either June or July for your larger deployments in the data center. And so you can see, just think of them as Legos. How many uh, of these blocks do you need? Add them up. That's your list pricing, and you'll see that it's actually pretty compelling. Uh, at less than $1,000 a terabyte, uh, and larger capacities, it gets down in the six dollars $700 per terabyte range. Uh, you have the ability to mix and match these nodes. So you can start with, uh, you know, a base configuration of, say, three of the two terabyte nodes. Six months down the road, oh, hey, we filled them up. Uh, let's go big and get the four terabyte add-on this time and expand our capacity to 10 terabytes. You can do this 
Uh, and each time you go to add more capacity, it's up to you what makes sense in terms of dollars and your projected growth. There's no restriction on how you mix and match these. And again, that 8 terabyte node will be available down the road, as well as some 100% uh, flash nodes that we're looking at putting into play later this year as well for a real high performance applications like websites and that kind of thing. And finally, this really addresses those two big hazards that we talked about in the big guess. Uh, when you go through and say, I want to spend the bare minimum to have a good backup, but I can't afford to run out of capacity, we've eliminated that problem. Uh, if you do your growth projection and you miss, you miss by a lot, it's not a problem. You're going back to the CFO for just a small incremental check and not that next $50,000 compellent, which, as you know, is never received very well no. by the financial officer. Yeah. OPEX versus CAPEX. There you go. And then uh, the other thing we've done just to make this even simpler is there's some really simple bundle starter kits. So uh, you always need to start with at least three nodes because one of the nodes will be redundant. Uh, you can have an unlimited number, but the minimum is three. But we put together examples here of 6, 12, and 20 terabyte bundles just to give you a sense of what that looks like. And if you do buy the bundled solutions, uh, it does get you somewhat of a discount. Uh, all these prices are list price. Uh, as we discussed a little farther in the partner program, uh, as an MSP or reseller partner of GridStore, you receive a 30% discount uh, on any sell-through to your end user customers. Uh, if you use this in a production NFR type environment for your own data, uh, it's a 50% discount. And again, once you've run through the space in these bundles and you go to add capacity, I think I've beat this horse for a while, you can simply add two or four terabyte nodes uh, as needed for additional capacity. So that's the whole price list. It's about as simple as it gets. Uh, let's talk about the Accelerate Partner Program. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, many of you have probably uh, bumped into me at previous lives. We mentioned Axian earlier. Uh, I go back even farther than that with Harry with the Untangle partner program. And, and frankly, this is the seventh time I've stood up a partner program in North America. And so at this point, I've got a pretty good sense of what's important to partners and, and what things they need to see to really be successful and what makes us a good vendor partner for our channel. And we were recently recognized by CRN with the Five Star Award uh, in, in recognition of the quality of our program. And I will now share with you all those elements. So first of all is our philosophy behind this. Again, we don't do any direct business. So your success is our success. Every time you win a new customer, you make a sale, we make a sale. If that doesn't happen, we don't win. So everything that we do is geared around making our partner successful with our solution with their customers. And there are a variety of program benefits in three different areas, and I'll go through those for you quickly. Uh, on the sales side, if you sign up as a grid store partner, you're going to get a dedicated account manager that you can reach. Uh, we are a, a US-based organization. We're based in the Silicon Valley here in Mountain View, California, uh, surrounded by Google, as it turns out. But uh, don't hold it against us. We try not to run over the Googlers on their multicolored bicycles every day on our way to and from the office. Uh, important to all of our reseller partners also is a deal registration program. Uh, we do provide sales leads, as I mentioned. We spend a fair amount of money doing end user demand gen. And as those opportunities come about, we qualify them and pass them out to our partners. The co-selling sales team is an in-house group of uh, inside sales folks that I have here that spend 100% of their time uh, prospecting and qualifying those end user opportunities which are then in turn, again, passed out to the partners. Uh, I've also got regional sales managers that travel in the field and can do uh, in-field uh, sales blitz days with your reps. Uh, they can come on site and do phone blitzes or go on sales calls. And then finally, we have a referral program because we know you're going to be excited and happy as a grid store partner. You'll want to bring some of your friends in as well. Uh, that referral program is pretty popular because it not only pays you for making the referral, but it pays your friend for coming on board. On the marketing side, we've got a dedicated team of folks that do nothing but joint marketing programs with our partners. We also have marketing development funds to help defray some of the expense. We have the partner portal, which is full of all kinds of good stuff, including co-brandable and rebrandable marketing material, uh, the solution briefs, white papers, you name it. Uh, we run a variety of end user webinars, again, to generate leads for our partners. 
And finally, we participated in field events as well. On the technical side, we have a live US-based tech support team right here in Mountain View. Uh, this is not going to be you know, support by chat and email only to India, uh, which I know is a real uh, sore point for our partners with some other vendors. Uh, we offer free unlimited technical training. And uh, we've got a base program, but we can do any specific topics. Or if you are selling into some exotic environments, we can work with you to make sure you're comfortable with the solution. And again, I mentioned the not for resale program. Again, that's a 50% discount off the solution for you. We also are running two promotions right now. Uh, the first one we call Light It Up. And what that says is we will pay you a $500 cash rebate the very first time you sell our solution to a customer. Some incentive to get your first one in place. Uh, and then the Skyrocket program is a joint program that we're running with one of our backup software vendors, which is Veeam. And this is an interesting one because we'll pay you $500 just to identify an opportunity to sell storage into a Veeam account or a net new Veeam and storage combination as a brand new backup solution. All you have to do is register the opportunity and we'll pay you $500 for that. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll also run the deal through you when it closes so you get a chance to make some more money downstream there as well. So next steps for you, assuming that you're interested and would like to learn more or become a grid store partner and get your hands on the gear, uh, give us a call. We'll hook you up with the program. We have a 30-day free evaluation program if you'd like to get some of the equipment in-house and test it out and, and, and you know, really press and test these outrageous claims that we're making about performance. Uh, and we're easy to find on just about every one of the uh, social media networks you can think of, uh, as well as on the web. So that's all the prepared content that we have. Here we've got about five more minutes, I guess, to take some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Could, could you go back one slide to the Veeam uh, that offer, offer? OK, so we will pay you $500 for Veeam storage leads. Now, I just want to clarify, because my sinister mind is already thinking that I should create a fake Gmail account with a fictitious name, and I'll, 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 I'll go hit it hard, and that money goes to Harry individually. So, but, but aside from that, um, when you say a lead, um, it's, it's a little bit like a police reward. You know, they'll pay you $100,000 if the person's caught and convicted, the key point being convicted. Um, is this a beam uh, lead that would close? Or is this $500 to say, hey, here's 12 names, you know, whoop, whoop. So Harry, uh, first of all, you are eligible, by the way. So don't hold back. If you know some, you should definitely register and get your money. Uh, but uh, so the way the process works is, uh, say you've, uh, and this could be one of your current customers as well, where you've got being deployed and you know that they are considering buying some additional storage. Uh, you would register that opportunity. One of my co-selling inside folks will call and qualify that customer to verify that. Yes, they are a Veeam account, and they're actually looking at buying storage. Uh, as long as they are considering buying storage, it's a budgeted project. Whether we win that business or not, we will still pay the $500, as long as it's a real opportunity. Um, the other no, flavor is, again, yeah, and the other flavor are companies that, say, are just about to kick off their virtualization uh, project, you know, a server refresh, and they're going to need a new backup solution for the way they back up their VM stack. And that could potentially be a net new Veeam Plus storage opportunity. Those qualify as well. And those in particular get our, uh, our friends over at Veeam pretty excited. So, uh, And we're not exclusively partnered with Veeam. It's just been one of the more popular joint solutions that we're sure. selling. And we've launched the program here this quarter. Uh, we do work also with StorageCraft, with Commvault, with Semantic Backup Exec, and, and just about every other name brand uh, backup solution that you can think of. Yeah, yeah, no, that's but that's a very generous offer. That's why I was clarifying it. Is that's uh, uh, Heather? I'm going to call you after the webinar and work with you offline on that one. Um, seriously, uh, we have a question. We have a question on who bills the client, um, or uh, uh, an individual's asking, and it, it could very well also be a question I would ask. I I I, I was listening intently to your slides, but. I, I, I guess I wasn't real clear myself. Who bills the client? You, you know, the old MSP question. Oh, you betcha. So uh, so the key here is that this is not really a SaaS offering, although it gets used in cloud environments quite a bit. Just think of it as on-prem equipment. So typically what will happen is an MSP or reseller will 
sell it to the customer, and then we will bill them the partner discounted pricing, and they retain their margin. So it's a normal sell-through of hardware, just like a server product. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then is there sort of, and I think you did cover this, I think you did have a point about deal protection or deal registration. The next logical question would be is that the MSP owns the client, and, and you're not going to oracle them and go around the, the side door and approach the customer. Is that fair? That's ex that's exactly right. So uh, we don't do any direct business, so our partners never have to worry about us scooping their bigger customers. The deal registration isn't as much for the MSPs because, as you mentioned, they, they tend to have pretty good account control in general, but more for the traditional IT reseller where you've got a customer that potentially will you know, leverage your expertise and then go shopping CDW for lower pricing. Uh, our solution, by the way, is not available from the CDWs and insights of the world, so you don't need to worry about that issue, uh, but you have the opportunity to register the deal and protect yourself as well. Okay, great. Uh, another question. We've got a couple minutes left. What is the breakdown per gigabyte? What is the breakdown per gigabyte? I think they're talking about, you know, pennies per generic pricing. Yep. So uh, if, if you look at it this way, so here's your list pricing. So you're looking at $1,500 for two terabytes. So I guess you have to do the math on it. I think it comes out to, what, 75 cents a gig or so. I'm yeah. not doing the math incorrectly in my head. And a little bit less uh, in the 4 terabyte capacity. Okay. Okay, cool. Matt just whipped out a, yeah, seven, Matt just whipped out a calculator. 74 cents. 74 cents a gigabyte. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I can't do math in my head anymore, so thank you very much. Um, okay, <laughs> we got several... We got several questions, and I'll I'll forward these to you guys so we can certainly make sure the attendees um, have their questions answered. We've got about a minute left. Um, can you mix uh, two, four, and eight terabyte nodes within the same solution? Yes, you can. That's one of the rig benefits of this architecture uh, is that you can mix and match and buy them as budget and requirements come up. So, and as we have, you know, I mentioned before, there's a a roadmap of new uh, versions of these nodes that are coming out over the course of the next year or so, and you may want to take advantage of higher performance nodes that are hybrid with flash and disk, or 100% flash, or or really dense capacity like the 8, and down the road probably 16 and 32 terabyte version nodes as well. Okay, and finally, because uh, we are at time, does this compete with Nextina plus NAS type of solutions? Uh, does, does that question make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So um, as a solution uh, uh, solution architect, so as a sales engineer, I work closely with product marketing and a few other groups. And um, yeah, unfortunately, we got grouped into the same pool as a lot of other vendors. But basically, there's uh, some fundamental differences between us and a lot of these guys. Um, Nextenta, uh, uh, I believe, and if I'm remembering them correctly, utilizes uh, ZFS. And ZFS is essentially open source from Solaris Oracle that does have some certain requirements. But again, it's, one, it's that whole open source play. Basically, you have a vendor that's taken an open source implementation. They've done some stuff to it, and they, they have basically implemented their own version of ZFS. Now, the thing with ZFS that I've learned high level, and I'll be as quick as possible here, is that it does provide a high level of fault tolerance just like we do. But where you really get penalized with those type of solutions is when something does break and you have to rebuild it, it can take days, if not weeks, depending on the size of the volume and a few other factors in order to get that stuff back. Plus, it's an all-in solution, and there's a whole lot of upfront commitment to the platform. Whereas with us, basically the commitment is, do you have some rack space and do you have a couple ports on the, on the switch or not, and, and go from there. Not to bag on ZFS or anything, because obviously th there is a need for it, and some environments do do it, like your Googles and Amazons, but we find it's a little inappropriate and a little heavy for the SMB, and that's why uh, we went with the grid-style architecture versus utilizing a ZFS. And, and even Mac and even Apple dropped ZFS support, so that should say something. <laughs> well, uh, we, we can't top that one. So, folks, we, we are at time. Thank you, thank you, thank you again so much for joining our weekly webinar. Um, today, my, my compliments, by the way, today was... Uh, robust. I mean, the, the technical conversation is, quite frankly, more technical than we've had in a while. So it's it's nice to mix it up. I mean, money makers are important, too. And 
uh, but, but, but this was fantastic. Folks, you'll be receiving an email shortly within 24 hours with the uh, replay link as, as well as a special message um, from, the, uh, from the sponsor grid store. And we'll uh, look forward to seeing you next week. And hopefully, we'll see you all up at the SMB Nation Spring Conference May 3rd through 5th at Microsoft Redmond. Uh, uh, heaps of the SMB 150 award winners will be there. And we're hearing from a lot of people that this is your chance to cross that off the bucket list and visit Microsoft Redmond. So, so Chris and gang, thank you very much. And uh, folks, have a fantastic day. Thanks, Harry.